there are a couple of things that will help as we begin to think about the nature of the verb. One of those is this kind of mark that is used to chop off or abbreviate. So we use the symbol hey with this chop mark, this abbreviation mark, to refer to uh, the word Hashem. And this is the word we, which means the name. So often people will use this abbreviation to refer to the name, which is used in place of the divine name. Elsewhere, like in the uh, BDB, uh, the main old traditional dictionary, they use the yod and then chop it off to refer to the four letters of the tetragrammaton or the divine name. Or if you're in an entry on a certain word, let's say the word for uh, messenger in the BDB, malach, all through the entry, if they're referring to uh, the term messenger, they'll just use the abbreviation mem and then chop the rest of it off. And sometimes these same kinds of abbreviations are used in working with verbs. At the same time, we use two of these tick marks together to join something together. So for example, when we see this abbreviation, tav, noon, joined together with kaf, this is the abbreviation for Tanakh, uh, which is short for the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, or the Torah prophets and the writing, the three main collections that make up the Hebrew Bible. And we'll use these two tick marks to join other things together when we talk about the verb. The word pa'al, which means to do or to make, has been used traditionally in Hebrew grammar to refer to uh, the different kinds of verbs. It's a paradigmatic word, and it's so much so that the three letters of the word pa'al refer to the first root letter, the second root letter, and the third root letter of any given verb. So if we take, for example, the verb yada, then the, uh, this would be considered a pei yod verb because the first root letter is a yod, or the pei letter. In addition to the traditional word pa'al, to which we'll return presently, the word katal, uh, which means to kill, this is used in modern grammatical uh, uh, works to refer to verbs because it is a strong verb, meaning that all three letters can take a dagesh and they don't drop out under certain circumstances. No gutturals and no Jonah letters. Um, gutturals, as you remember, are aleph, he, chet, ayin, and we count resh as well. And the Jonah letters are the letters that make up the prophet Jonah's name and these letters, um, Yod, Vav, Nun, He, these all can drop out. So any word that has uh, either a guttural or a Jonah letter is considered a weak word, whereas a word that doesn't have any of those letters is a strong word. So that's why in modern times we use the word katal to refer to uh, a, as a paradigm word because it shows all the shape of the different verb forms. Verbs have three parts that we have to be worried about. First is the root. So in the word katal, the root is kof, tate, lamed. That's the three root letters. And again, this is a strong root. Now in addition to a strong root, there's other kinds of roots that have different um, sorts of phenomena. So if we take the word Siva, he commanded. This is a lamed he root because the third root letter is he, or the lamed letter from the paradigm word um, pa'al is a he. Or if we take a word like 
um, Natan, which means he gave or to give. This is a uh, pay noon word because the pay letter is noon. And since it's a Jonah letter, it's susceptible to uh, disappearing under certain circumstances. For the time being, we're only going to worry about uh, strong uh, roots like katal. And we'll worry about the weak roots later. But that's one of the things that the student has to keep in mind during memory, uh, uh, vocabulary memory, is to associate the meanings of the verbs with the roots and be able to identify the roots uh, when reading scripture in context when it's conjugated. Next are the binyanim or the stems. Now the binyanim comes from uh, the Hebrew word for binyan uh, which means building and binyanim is the plural buildings. And then the other traditional word that's used is stems. Now there are uh, seven main stems or binyanim that we have to worry about. There's a few others, but the seven main ones are kal, nifal, pl, pu'al, hitpa'el, hifil, and hofal. Now the main one is kal, and this means light or plain. All of the other ones have something done to them, as we'll see presently. Now the binyanim get their name from their names from the word pa'al, except for kal. Kal comes again from the word light, which means lightness or it's it's plain. It doesn't have anything added. All of the others. Uh, binyanim or stems have something added like nifal is from the word pu'al uh, pa'al but it has the noon attached to the beginning so that's the morphological um, connection now all of these have something in common which is difficult to see here but the p'l pu'al and hit pa'el if it were a strong word which it's not would take a dagesh in the middle letter that's why we use the term uh, katal in modern times because it doesn't have a problem with a guttural in the middle. But nonetheless, we call these three roots that are related pl, pu'al, hitpa'el because of how they're formed with the root word pa'al. And then thirdly, there's a third group called hifil and hof'al. You'll notice in the hof'al, it's a closed, unaccented syllable so it has the kamatz katon, or kamatz hatuv sound. Now, each of these different binyanim have a different uh, sort of mood or sense to them when these uh, different uh, um, stems are used on a particular word. In the most basic sense, then, when a word is in nifal, it's either passive or reflexive, typically. In PL, it's slightly more complex than KAL. At least that's true when there's a root that is used in both KAL and PL. So the term has a more complex meaning to it or a more intensive meaning. PUAL is just the passive of PL. And then HITPAL is either reflexive or passive. HIFIL has a sense of causation. And Hofal is passive of hifil. The third thing to attend to in verbs is their form. There's two main forms that we call the perfect or the imperfect. Now the perfect of katal is katal. And so that's he has killed, or he killed. And the perfect of, uh, the imperfect of katal is yiktol. So sometimes we even will call this 
uh, because we use this paradigm word so much, a caudal form or a yictal form. And you'll see this fairly commonly in the literature, but probably the main names still are perfect and imperfect. Now these two um, main verbs, there's a, several subcategories of imperfect that we'll get to later. But the other thing to take note of is in the case of the perfect verb, when a vav, simple vav, is added to the front of the um, perfect word, then we ca uh, would call this a um, uh, vav consecutive perfect. And it changes it from a simple past to a um, simple future. So if we see the word uh, v katal, we would say he will kill. So the good news is uh, when you memorize the perfect paradigm, you also will get the bonus uh, uh, vav consecutive perfect paradigm for free with your memory. There's something similar that goes on with the imperfect, but we'll talk about that later. And besides the two main forms, perfect and imperfect, there's also the imperative form, there's the infinitive form, and there's the participle form. You'll notice um, we call these forms, not tenses, because it doesn't have a tense in the same way that English does or Greek. Rather, it has a form, and then the tensing is determined by the context. And as we go along and learn more grammar, we'll fill in the blanks more with how these forms work. Now, briefly, there's two models that help us understand the verb altogether. So when we put together, say, the root, uh, that's the three root letters. That's kind of like the root of the word. And it's not a word yet, it's just a root. And it becomes a verb when it has both a stem, whichever stem it is, kal, pl, hifil, or one of the minor stems. And then finally, it needs a form. It has to either be perfect or imperfect, cohortative, jussive, or subcategories of imperfect, or imperative, infinitive, or participle. And so these, the pronoun and the other conjugation elements come in with the form. And so all three of these pieces together are what we need to consider when we're working with a particular verb. Now here's one more model to think through the verb as a whole, especially from the perspective of the student who has to manage their way through it. If you would pretend that this is a stack of pages that represents the verb charts that you'll find in the back of any uh, first year grammar, which lists all the different kinds of the form of the word katal. And so on the first page uh, will always be the strong uh, verb, and usually it is represented by katal. And um, across this direction, um, each of the columns will be one of the different stems. Kal, Nifal, Pl, Pual, Hipal, Hifil, and Hofal, so that these can be compared one right next to the other. Then as one makes their way down the page, this is where all the normal forms are listed. And typically, perfect will be listed at the top, then imperfect, and then um, the imperative, infinitive, and participle all the way down the page. Now that whole first page then is the strong root. And then all of these pages running back on the vertical axis, these are all the different kinds of root types which have either a guttural letter as one of the letters because they don't take dagashim and they have also particular needs relative to uh, vowels. So that sort of changes the spelling that you would find on the strong verb page or they have Jonah letters. They might have a Yod, a Vav, a Nun, or a He. And just like the prophet that gets swallowed up, these letters are apt to get swallowed up under certain circumstances. So what we'll worry about is this first strong root page and uh, handle all of those. 
and then we have to work our way back through the other pages later to see what happens when there's a guttural letter or a Jonah letter.